Good morning. Welcome to Creating Effective Graphs, today's webinar from the Department of Scientific Publications. I'm Sunita Patterson. I'm a senior scientific editor in the department. And today I'm going to be talking about how to design graphs so that readers will be able to easily understand your results and their significance. If you have any questions, please feel free to type them in the chat room, and I'll try to answer them periodically during the webinar or at the end, depending on time. And um, a recording of the webinar will be uploaded to our department intranet site so you can go back and rewatch anything you missed. So I'm going to be talking about, um, first of all, when to use a graph, types of graphs, and what they should include, and general principles for designing effective graphs. So I'm going to turn the um, camera off now so that we can focus on the slides. So first let's talk about when to use a graph versus when to use text or a table instead. We want to pick the format that presents the data most clearly and concisely. So here are reasons you would want to use just text instead of a graph. You probably don't need a graph if you have only a few data points. In that case, the data can probably be presented clearly and concisely in a sentence or two. Or, if there's nothing to see because there was no variation, the visual image is not interesting or illuminating, then just use text. For example, here are some data written in sentence form. At diagnosis, the mean tumor volumes were 4.5 cubic centimeters for group A and 2.6 for group B. At the end of treatment, mean volumes had not significantly changed, 4.7 for group A and 2.7 for group B. Very clear, right? So seeing these data in the form of a line graph does not aid our understanding. This graph illustrates both of the problems I mentioned. There are not enough data here to justify the space used by the graph. The graph is too simple. And furthermore, there's no interesting trend to look at. If there's not an interesting trend, even if there were a lot of data, then a graph is still not a good use of space. So let's assume that you have more than a few data to present. Here are some things to consider in deciding whether to use a table or a graph. If readers will be interested in precise numeric values, a table is usually better than a graph, unless you have just a few numbers, in which case use text. Graphs give a general sense of quantities, but it's harder to discern the exact numeric value represented by a bar or a point on a graph. And if you have lots of data in a lot of different categories, a table may be better than a graph. Graphs may capture only a few variables at a time, whereas a table with multiple rows and columns can present more dimensions of the data, allowing detailed comparisons. For example, this is a table of adverse events observed in a clinical trial of two treatments, UFT and S1, and it presents a lot of information about those events. The rows and columns organize the information so readers can find specific values of interest and make comparisons easily. These data would take up paragraphs of space in the text, and there are too many to, pre to present effectively in a graph. So now that we've talked about when not to use a graph, let's look at why you would want to use a graph. A graph is useful to show trends in data. And a graph can also show relationships between data. A graph gives readers a snapshot of the information where details take a backseat to the main message. The data should be interesting or informative as a picture. For example, here's a simple line graph. Without getting into the specifics of what's being measured, we can see at a glance an overall trend. There was an increase and then a decrease. That point is immediately communicated. A closer look would reveal more specific information. And this line graph shows incidence rates of hepatitis types A, B, and C in the United States by year. 
we can see the overall trend for each form of hepatitis. For example, for hepatitis A, the solid line, there were two periods of increased incidence and then a big drop. We can also see relationships between these lines. For example, which forms of hepatitis had the most and fewest, fewest cases in a particular year? This picture conveys quickly and concisely information that would take a lot of words in text or 30 rows in a table. So now let's take a look at some common types of graphs that we often see in scientific writing. And um, we'll look at some examples, some of which are adapted from the literature and some we made up ourselves. And let me just note that I'm an editor, not a scientist or statistician, so I may not be able to answer questions about the scientific aspects of the graphs. But my focus is on the ways the authors have made the graphs clear and reader friendly. So I'm going to start with the simplest type of graph, a pie chart or pie graph. You can use a pie chart to show the proportions of the components of a whole. I've put a shortened version of the published legend for this figure at the bottom of the slide. These pie charts show percentage distribution of five leading causes of death by age group. The age groups are represented by the different circular pies. Like pieces of a pie, the wedges represent the proportions of the whole. Here, the different colored wedges represent the causes of death. Pie charts are not very common in scientific writing, but I see them once in a while, for example, for describing survey results. Um, a couple of features to note about effective pie charts. The graph should show what each wedge represents. So here a key at the right of the graph tells us which color represents which cause of death. Pie charts are often shown in groups. So here we can track the bright green wedge representing cancer across each age group. Another important feature is that the numbers or percentages represented by each wedge should be shown. They should add up to 100%. Let's look at a line graph. Line graphs are used to show the relationship between two quantitative continuous variables. As described in the legend, this graph shows mean body weights of guinea pigs fed two different types of diets with and without adequate protein for 10 months. A line graph shows changes in y as a function of x. The x-axis, or horizontal axis, represents the independent variable, the variable that is thought to influence the dependent variable. Here, that would be time period in months. The y-axis, or vertical axis, represents the dependent variable, the outcome variable of interest. Here, it's body weight. The two curves represent the two groups that were fed different diets. So let's note some features of an effective line graph. The axes have tick marks indicating values. On linear scales, tick marks representing equal intervals should be equally spaced. The values on the axis usually extend from zero to the highest number of any data point on the graph. The axes and their labeling should not extend far beyond the data shown. If your values are all very high, it's usually acceptable to put a break in the axis and omit some values from the scale. The axes should be clearly labeled, including units of measure, such as grams here. The symbols used for the data points should be easily distinguishable. For example, closed and open circles when there are only two lines. And finally, the symbols should be defined in a key placed wherever there's room on the graph. One, for, one form of line graph is the Kaplan-Meier survival curve or plot. This plot shows survival in three hypothetical groups of patients. The x-axis represents time and months, and the y-axis represents the proportion of patients surviving or event-free. 
Here the key at the top identifies the groups represented by each line. Vertical notches on the curves indicate individual censored patients. It's common to include p-values for the comparison of the groups. Notice that the authors have made clear the comparison each p-value represents. A recommended feature of an effective survival curve is a table below the x-axis with the number of patients in each group at risk at each time point. Scatter plots show the relationship between two continuous variables that don't necessarily have a cause and effect relationship. This plot compares data obtained by RNA sequencing and data obtained by quantitative RT-PCR for 20 genes. Scatter plots are closely related to line graphs in that, in both cases, the x and y axes represent quantitative variables. In a scatter plot, the data are represented with dots but are not connected with a line. Here we see one dot for each of the 20 genes. Their expression level by quantitative RT-PCR is plotted on the x-axis, and their expression by RNA sequencing is plotted on the y-axis. The trend seen in this pattern of dots demonstrates agreement of the modalities. It may be statistically appropriate to draw a line on a scatter plot as seen here, and the legend should explain it. This plot's legend states that the data were fit into a linear regression. As I mentioned for line graphs, the axes should not extend much beyond the data and should be clearly labeled. Bar graphs or bar charts are used to compare amounts, frequencies, or magnitudes for categories of discontinuous data. This bar graph shows variations by physician specialty in performance of certain tests during typical office visits. Bar graphs have one quantitative, vari quantitative variable. Since this is a vertical or column graph, that quantitative variable is on the y-axis. Here, the measured variable is the proportion of physicians who did perform the tests. The categorical variable is on the x-axis, in this case, the four tests performed. In this clustered bar graph, for each test, there's a cluster of bars representing subcategories, with the different shading of the bars representing different physician specialties. A key explaining the bar shading is easy to find. If your categories have long titles, or there are a lot of categories, you might want to use a horizontal bar graph. These are the same data that we just saw, but now the categories are on the y-axis and the measured variable is on the x-axis. This format, this format is less common than a vert vertical bar graph. Note that whether arranged vertically or horizontally, the bars should all be the same width. We do not recommend 3D style graphs. The 3D effect detracts from the readability of the graph. Also, it can be ambiguous. For some of these bars, it's hard to tell what value is represented because it's not clear exactly where on the x-axis the bar lines up to. Another way of showing subcategories is to use a stacked bar graph. This type of graph is useful for showing proportions of the subcategories within each group. For example, this graph shows what environments hospitalized older adults were released to at discharge, with the three bars representing age groups. Instead of a key, as we've seen on previous graphs, these authors have placed subcategory names alongside the corresponding colors at the right side of the graph. For the first bar, the 65 to 74-year-old age group, the dark blue portion at the bottom indicates that 71% of patients were discharged home. Then moving up, 5% were discharged to a short-term care facility, and so on. So a disadvantage of this type of graph is that while we can easily compare the dark blue bottom components across all the groups, since they're all aligned on the x-axis, for the other components, interpretation is less precise. 
These authors have helped with that issue by including the percentages on the bars. However, because of this drawback, I've seen at least one journal that does not accept stacked bar graphs. That's um, JAMA Oncology. A dot, a dot plot, also known as a dot graph or point graph, is useful if you have a quantitative variable and a categorical variable and want to show individual values. This plot shows platelet counts for patients with primary or secondary dengue infections. We have the quantitative variable on the y-axis, platelet counts, and a categorical variable, primary versus secondary infection, on the x-axis. The authors could have presented bars sum summarizing median platelet counts, but instead the platelet counts for each patient have been plotted. Median values are marked by the red lines, and the published legend did mention that. I shortened the legend for this slide. By seeing the individual data points, we can see that the distribution patterns for primary versus secondary infection were quite different. A box and whiskers plot, or box plot, is another way of showing how individuals are distributed in a, cap in a category. This plot shows Shannon diversity index for diarrheal and non-diarrheal samples from children stratified by age group. As for the bar graphs, we have the measured quantitative variable on the y-axis. Here it's the Shannon diversity index. We have the categorical variable on the x-axis, age group and months. We have subcategories represented by red and gray defined in the key at the top. Each rectangle <clears throat> or box represents the interquartile range the middle 50% of the values in that category. The horizontal line in the box indicates the median value. And in this plot, we also have a diamond in the box. It's centered on the mean value. The vertical lines, or whiskers, represent values beyond the interquartile range that are within a certain defined range. That defined range differs among studies, so be sure to describe describe it in the figure legend, which these authors did. The dots represent individual outliers beyond the values represented by the whiskers. So this type of plot provides a lot of information very concisely. One last type of graph that we commonly see in the manuscripts we edit is the frequency histogram. These are useful to show the distribution of individuals in a population. This is a frequency histogram for an outbreak of the Salmonella Heidelberg strain. On the x-axis are the months of 2011, divided further so that one column is shown for each week. On the y-axis, we can see the count or number of people who had positive cultures each week. Overlaid on this frequency histogram for comparison is a black reference line representing the mean number of cases per week of the year over the past five years. The key clarifies this. Note that in a frequency histogram, there should be no space between the bars unless there are no data to report for a category. So there are other types of graphs, but those are the ones I see most often in the manuscripts and grant proposals that I edit. So now I'm going to summarize some general design principles to keep in mind no matter what type of graph you're creating. Some of these principles I've touched on already. So let's look at some overall principles and then examples. The main goal in designing a graph is to make it easy for your readers to understand the point you're trying to convey. To help make the purpose or key point of the graph clear at a glance, here are some things you can do. Use a logical arrangement for the data categories and components. Keep in mind that English speakers tend to look at graph components from left to right and from top to bottom just as they read a page. Be sure to label the key elements of the graph. 
and be sure the data symbols, lines, or bars can be easily distinguished. Avoid clutter that will distract from the main point. Some examples of clutter are 3D effects, too many curves, and unnecessary information. Use color in a way that enhances the clarity of the data, not just for visual effect. Keep in mind that some journals don't print graphs and color in the paper edition of the journal unless the author pays. I'll say a little more about using color in a moment. Ideally, the main message of the graph will come across without the reader having to read the legend. However, an effective legend provides additional context and details. And finally, aim for consistent styles across all of your graphs for a more polished document or presentation. So let's take a closer look now at some of these principles. An important element in effective graph design is labeling the graph so that readers can understand it easily. This is a graph of birth rates with individual curves representing age ranges of the mother from 1975 to 2015. These overlapping curves are distinguished from each other with color, and each curve is labeled directly instead of via a key. Putting information on the figure itself rather than in a key or in the figure legend makes it easier for readers. Titles are not usually needed over graphs. Prepare your title as a legend instead. The exception would be a figure composed of multiple similar graphs, with each graph showing a different disease site or cell line, molecule, etc. So here the authors have labeled the graphs with the names of genes, so we can quickly tell which graph goes with which gene. Here are a few additional tips for the text labels on graphs. If the journal will print your graphs smaller than the originals, make labeling large so that it's still readable when the figures are reduced. A style note, since I'm an editor, your manuscript will look more polished if you use a consistent style for capitalization throughout all the figures. In axis and figure labels, most journals capitalize only the first word. For example, in the y-axis label you see here, capital B for body, but lowercase w for weight. Some journals will capitalize all keywords in figure labels, capital B and capital W. Of course, always capitalize acronyms or proper nouns. If the labels describe measurements, indicate the units in the labels. You can follow the variable name with a comma in the unit, grams here, or you can enclose the unit in parentheses. The important thing is to be consistent in all your graphs. To distinguish data in graphs, use distinct symbols, lines, and patterns. For data points, if there are two dependent variables, open and closed circles are easy to distinguish. If plotting multiple dependent variables, Try open circles, triangles, squares, and closed circles, triangles, and squares. For lines on line graphs, use black, solid, dashed, and dotted lines, or they can be all black, so they can be all solid black if the lines don't intersect and the lines are labeled rather than using a key. But if you have a lot of lines, you may need to use different colors. And to distinguish between bars on bar graphs, Use black, white, and distinct shades of gray. Patterned or textured fills were used in the past because they reproduced better than solid gray, but with modern digital files, many journals prefer gray and discourage the use of patterns, which can look busy. And again, if you have a lot of bar subcategories, you may need to use different colors. When I say avoid clutter on your graphs, what do I mean? unnecessary elements of a graph that don't enhance understanding and make it harder to find the key information. So background colors and grid lines like you see here can represent clutter. Another way to think about this is that most of the ink should be used for the data. If grid lines are needed for understanding, use gray so that they're not prominent. A few comments about using color. 
Some journals require authors to pay for printing of color figures, as you can see from this small sample. Thus, it's wise to read the author instructions for your target journal before, make, before you make your graphs. And if you're not sure which journal you'll be publishing in, we recommend avoiding using color in your graphs unless it's necessary for clarity, or it could get very expensive. If the graph won't be printed in color, don't design it in color because colors don't reproduce well in black and white. So here's some things to consider when cho choosing which colors to use. Black, red, and blue are the best colors to use. Yellow should be avoided because it doesn't show up well. Consider colorblind readers and try not to use red and green in the same graph. Avoid loud or very bright colors. And keep it simple. Use as few colors as possible. Let's look at a couple of examples. So some color combinations are indistinguishable to colorblind readers. Thus, for some readers, the red and green arrows in this graph may be confusing. It would be better here to use text labels instead of colored arrows to differentiate these lines. And if the um, lines were labeled with text here instead of arrows, you could eliminate that key at the top. When I said avoid loud colors, this is what I meant. I think these colors are a little too bright for scientific communication. So if you're using color, I would suggest more muted classic colors to look more formal. Color should serve a purpose. It should be used to make distinctions, not to simply dress up a graph. So here the color is cute, but unnecessary. All black or a single color would work here. Let's look at how to write an effective legend. A legend adds context and details beyond what is visible in the graph itself. So here's some things to include. State briefly the overall subject or message you wish readers to receive from the graph or the most important finding evident in the graph. Include the number of patients or samples. Define abbreviations and explain symbols used in the graph. If it's not obvious, you may want to include the method used. And it may be appropriate to include the statistical tests used and details such as what error bars represent. But keep the legend as short as possible. For example, um, here's a very common format for figure legends, um, starting with the figure number and a bold summary of the main point conveyed by the figure. So this is the legend for the dot plot that we looked at earlier. And enough detail is included that the figure is understandable without reading the main text. Finally, aim for consistency across all of your graphs. That can be hard when you have multiple authors doing different pieces of the manuscript. Try to have one author or designer do all the graphs. But if that's not possible, um, use the same software if possible. Um, if you have different groups or categories that will appear in multiple graphs, it'll be easier for readers if you use a consistent order in each graph. So you could try to decide on that ahead of time and communicate it to all of the authors. Decide on fonts and data symbols up front, and again, communicate them to all authors. If you've decided on a journal, check the author instructions for guidance. Um, if no fonts are specified, we recommend standard sans serif fonts, such as Helvetica or Arial. Um, we've used Helvetica for most of these graphs because they're very readable and recognized by all publishing software. And last, be sure you're using consistent terms in the graphs and in the graphs and in the main text. Again, advice from an editor. For example, the standard name of a drug, whether there's a hyphen in a molecule name, the capitalization style of a cell line, just for a more polished look. So that brings me to the end of the material I've prepared. Um, please feel free to type any questions in the chat room.
And while I'm waiting for questions, these are the main sources I've drawn on for this presentation. And we'll put a handout with more details on these and other resources on our department's homepage when we upload the recording of this webinar. And these are the sources for the graphs that I used. I edited some of them for simplicity and clarity. But in case you want to go back, we'll also put the slides on our home page along with this recording. So let me turn the camera back on. Oh, thanks for your comments. Does anyone have any questions? Thank you. Yeah, type if you can type the question into the um, chat box if it's um, something easily typed. Uh, if you have a specific question about a graph or something that would be hard to type in, please feel free to contact an editor in our department. Um, you see here our um, department email address, our, our phone number. Um, you can always drop in on our department. We're in, we're in 1MC, and the editor is always happy to talk with you or um, consult with you um, uh, on graphs or other issues related to editing and um, publishing. Um, our homepage, as you see it right here, is the URL for our homepage. You can also find it um, through the inside um, MD Anderson's inside intranet page um, under um, department, departments and programs, um, scientific publications. And it's our um, home page. And um, on that home page is where we will post. It'll probably take a couple days to get this recording, the slides, and the handout posted. OK, let me try to answer this question. Um, OK, I have about nine groups. And they all each might need to have different colors. But it seems like there aren't enough basic colors. What would you suggest for nine groups? Hmm. Maybe, sh maybe several colors, um, but different gradients of colors, like maybe a dark blue, medium blue, light blue, and um, dark red, in, yeah, burgundy, red. Um, um, I think maybe you might bring in gradients to make it looking to make it not have so many um, different colors. I, th I think I would try a small number of smaller number of colors than nine, but just gradients. Good. Um, no, our, our services are free. We're freely uh, editors are available to um, consult with you, and we're always happy to answer questions. Our, uh, we're um, here to serve MD Anderson's faculty and staff. Okay, I appreciated the reminder about colorblind people. Rainbow scales are impossible to read. Yeah. Um, I'll mention, while I'm waiting for any other questions, I'll just mention that our next webinar will be March 20th. Um, Stephanie Deming is going to talk about strategies for selecting a journal and avoiding disreputable journals. So join us for that. And um, on our homepage um, is links to our previous webinars. And in fact, we had one on creating effective tables um, that you can access there at that URL that you see there on this page. So I see a couple other people are typing. You refer to text under captions as legends. I've heard these called captions, and what you called a key called a legend. You, uh, you're right. Um, there, can you clarify if there's a correct way to refer to these elements? I, I um, Caption or legend is is are equally acceptable for the text that appears under a figure. And I know that um, the Microsoft Office applications call what I called a key. They call a legend. Um, so I think I think you are you are correctly noticing that some of these terms are interchangeable. Will you have any webinar teaching software or tools to create graphs? Um, 
if I'm understanding your question correctly, um, uh, GraphPad Prism is preferred software here at MD Anderson, and I think is available um, available um, to all users um, here. Um, I I personally don't um, have a, a, a background in using a lot of different software, so um, I can't recommend a particular one. The handout that will be on our um, internet site does have a couple of um, articles that talk about general um, general tech, tech, more technical approaches to creating graphs, and there may be some helpful information there. Alrighty. Um, well, I hope I answered those questions um, adequately. And if, if you have any more questions, please feel free to um, contact us at the email you see here, phone, or uh, contact me, Sunita Patterson, directly. Um, thank you so much for joining me today. And um, thanks. Thank you very much. <laughs>